Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Amata, where as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Now guys, I know you haven't heard my melodious voice in a few days, that's because I was away in Swansea with the other half just visiting a friend, very well needed break. Uh, but now I'm back and we're going to start things off with TSMC and Global Foundries. So I'm sure you guys have heard all about the fact that Global Foundries at the end of August basically accused TSMC of violating various patents. And of course TSMC has basically denied this, called them being quote unquote without merit, but it hasn't stopped there, which is why I'm here talking about this topic, as we have several countersuits from TSMC against Global Foundries. So they have filed multiple countersuits in the US, Germany, and Singapore for infringing on its patents pertaining to photolithography processes. They said that they were, quote, ready for battle in the courts and they will seek, quote, substantial monetary damages, violation of its IP. Fortunately, they didn't exactly say the bill they're going to be expecting, but rest assured, you're probably not going to find it down the back of the sofa cushions. But, what are TSMC actually including, accusing, excuse me, Global Foundries of? So, they are saying that Global Foundries has infringed on 25 patents, and these are relating to 40NM, 28NM, 22NM, 14NM, and 12NM node processes, and the methods that are used in manufacturing these chips. It doesn't stop there, however. They are not pulling any punches here, as they are asking the courts to prevent global foundries from producing and selling any semiconductors that incorporate these patent violations. So let's pretend that we've gone far forward in the future and this court case has reached some sort of conclusion. If it goes against Global Foundries, they will be severely, and I do mean severely, impacted. And no matter which way this lawsuit ends up going, this is going to have an impact on the industry pretty much as it's still going. You've got two of the biggest players in this particular era who are basically involved in what is going to be an extremely lengthy legal battle. You guys know that lawsuits, they just take a long time, especially when the people involved have an army of expensive lawyers at their disposal. So it's going to be quite some time before this reaches any sort of conclusion, unfortunately. Before we move on to our next topic, however, I do have a brief statement from Sam Azar, a Global Foundries exec, who said, quote, TSMC has long used its dominant market position to exert pressure on its smaller competitors, and retaliatory litigation filed today is in keeping with that history. We have confidence in our position and the legal process, and we are not intimidated by these actions. And if you ask me, that's basically the legal way of saying, come at me, bro. But... You know, that's just my opinion. Again, the impact on the industry is going to be felt even as these proceedings go forward, and whichever way it ends up going, for both sides, that being Global Foundry's lawsuits against TSMC, and now, of course, the countersuits from TSMC, it's going to be messy. But... Some better news from Global Foundries, as we have a new technology being unveiled from them. So what we have here is a new 12LP Plus fabrication process. And yes, this is, as you might guess by the name, based upon their work with 12NM. It expands on the 12LP process, as the name very much says, but it does bring with it some improvements, of course. We see a 20% increase in performance at the same power, or a 40% reduction in power requirements. We also see a 15% improvement in logic area scaling when compared to its predecessor. Interestingly, Global Foundries is actually saying that the chip brings with it some advantages that you can even compare to 7NM, which of course is currently doing the rounds in both Ryzen and the RX 5700 and 5700 XT. I do have a bit of a statement here from Michael Mendicino, whose name I hopefully I pronounced correctly, who is the Vice President of Digital Technology Solutions at Global Foundries, and they said, quote, our 12LP Plus solution already offers clients a majority of the performance and power advantages they would expect to gain from a 7NM process, but their NRE, or non-recurring engineering costs, will average only about half as much, a significant savings savings. Additionally, because the 12NM node has been running longer and is much more mature, clients will be able to tape out quickly and take advantage of the growing demand for AI technology. So, there are valid points there. Yes, it is mature. Yes, it will be able to tape out quicker. 
the savings, obviously, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a multi-million uh, corporation making these chips the last I checked, but it is an interesting claim nonetheless that even though this is still 12NM that it can be compared and put on a similar playing field to what's currently going on with 7NM. Of course, we are expecting 7NM Plus fairly soon, and well, I say soon, soon in technology terms is not like tomorrow, it's next year, most likely, um, but regardless of that, obviously 7NM is still fairly new, and there are still usual t issues going alongside it. Things are mostly ironed out now, but who knows what's going to crop up in the future. Still, how, clue, how true rather their claim ends up being, and how much use this 12LP Plus solution actually gets, especially in the midst of their legal battle with TSMC, is definitely going to be one to watch. So let's move on from that, however, to something a bit more general, as we have a very interesting report from Bleeping Computer about the Windows 10 second half of 19 update. So, what does this actually bring to the table, I hear you ask? Well, it's going to have the ability to have awareness of quote-unquote favoured calls. So basically, this makes use of the ability of some of the more recent processors to sell the OS, which of the calls are better than the other. So in theory, they can push more single-threaded workloads to that call to basically get the highest boost clocks. Obviously, as we have discussed many times, as I'm sure you guys are very much aware, not all calls on a multi-core processor are created equal. You are going to have calls that are better and calls that are worse, as well as, of course, the king of the crop, the best to die out of the lot. And obviously, these are the favoured calls. So this optimization could improve performance significantly, or at least according to the Bleeding Computer's report, quotes up to 15%. There is a catch, though, a caveat, unsurprisingly. This does require the processor to have support for Turbo Boost Max 3.0. It's only found in Intel HEDT processors. Now, that's not to say there's been nothing for AMD. They have already introduced more awareness to the multi-CCX and multi-die design of Zen processors, but they haven't been able to exploit a favoured cores in the same way as they have here with Turbo Boost Max 3. So obviously, as we move forward, we're probably going to see this technology supported across more processors, hopefully more sort of desktop, consumer, gaming level processors. That would be lovely to see, but it's still good to see at all. Just hope it becomes a bit more widespread in the future. But let's move on from that now to something from AMD next. We have a couple of AMD pieces actually, but we're going to start things off with some Ryzen news. So what we actually have here is a Geekbench benchmark, try saying that 10 times fast, of the Ryzen 5 3500X. Now as you can see on screen, I have pitted this against the current Ryzen 6 3700X, just to get a feel of how it compares against this other processor. So what do we see in terms of results? Well, we see a single core score of 1307 and a multi-core score of 6265. Now, just to kind of bring this to your attention, you will not undoubtedly notice down in the system information section that the 3500X does not have SMT. We kind of already knew this already, but that does not mean it's not looking really, really good, and really good for games, especially considering we're expecting this to be fairly cheap and cheerful, especially amongst the Ryzen 3000 family. So basically the TLDR of what we can see here is that this is looking like a really nice addition to Ryzen 3000, and a really solid choice for those of you who would potentially be looking to build a budget build that is not going to break the bank, obviously, but still give you some nice performance and a processor that's still going to last you a good couple of years. Because yes, it's going to be on the cheaper end of the spectrum, but you still want to get a few good years out of it before you have to upgrade. Of course, how long it will last, only time can tell, but it's still looking very promising. So we're going to finish things up now with something further from AMD regarding the RX 5500. So, you can find an article that Paul has written about this on redgamingtech.com linked in the description below this video. We've been talking a lot about, you know, big Navi, we're going to see a top-end Navi soon, but we've also been talking about the lower end and how AMD definitely are aware of the fact that they need to kind of plug that end of their market, especially because Polaris is really showing its age at the moment. But apparently, according to a report from WCCF Tech, we're going to be seeing a RX 5500 release, which is going to have 22 compute units, 
hundred sorry fourteen oh eight shaders, and either four gigs or eight gigs of GDDR6 memory on a one hundred twenty eight bit memory bus. Now, unfortunately, we do not know the clock frequency of the memory. However, but we can kind of make an educated guesstimate. With 14 Gbps memory, it would be 224 gigabytes a second. And at the fastest memory, 16, we could expect 256. And apparently, according to further reports from videocards.com, we won't have to wait all that long to see how legit this is actually going to be. It's going to launch on the 7th of this month, apparently. So, if that is the case, we can probably expect a reveal from AMD quite soon. But NVIDIA are not one to rest on their laurels as I've discussed numerous times. They also are aware that the lower end is obviously where they're going to see the volume and this is a potential area where AMD could really challenge them. And with this, we're apparently going to be seeing a new GTX 1650 card and also another 1660 Super. So apparently the 1650 Super is the 1650 tie that we were talking about some time ago, so basically you gone and get yourself renamed before it even released. But to be fair, that would make sense. It puts it in with the other Super cards and doesn't make things confusing. It keeps the brand clean and consistent. So if that is the case, can't really blame NVIDIA on that one. And it's probably going to feature uh, 1024 to maybe 1152. The 1660 Super, however, as Paul himself points out in our article, which again you can find linked below, is a bit of an odd duck because, well, it has the same number of CUDA cores as the current vanilla 1660, but it will have much faster memory. An interesting choice that could be very intriguing to see play out. And according, again, to the same reports, we can expect to see these cards from NVIDIA at the end of the month. So it's all heating up on the lower end of the spectrum of their graphics card families for both companies. Allegedly, we're going to be getting a new RX soon and a new GTX slash RTX, whatever you want to call it, at the end of the month as well. So... For those of you who have been waiting for something a touch more affordable from both companies, it seems both of them have decided to answer your wishes. But that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe. It does help out a great deal. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.